Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to this panel on navigating responsible use of generative AI in teaching and learning, developing UBC-wide principles and guidelines. And we are a group of folks, of uh, members of the Advisory Committee on Generative AI in Teaching and Learning, which I will be talking about in a little bit. My name is Christina Hendricks and I am the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President Teaching and Learning Pro Tem at uh, uh, the University of British Columbia Vancouver campus. Uh, I believe we were also going to record this session, were we not? It is recording. It is recording. Thank you. I can't tell. Goodness me. Okay. All right. So I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I am joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, which is Vancouver's Point Grey campus. Uh, that's where this is located. Uh, others of you may be joining from the uh, territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, uh, perhaps in the Lower Mainland, uh, elsewhere in um, uh, BC. Some of you may be joining us from UBC Okanagan, which is located on the Silk Okanagan Nation territories, unceded um, and ancestral territories. And as I'm giving the um, land acknowledgement today, I'm thinking in part about uh, indigenous data sovereignty principles, which and, and how those intersect with generative AI. Um, and indigenous data sovereignty is something that this committee has been talking about quite extensively and has been consulting on a fair bit as well. Um, because uh, in in terms of in broad terms, indigenous status sovereignty is around the rights of indigenous nations to govern the collection, ownership, use, uh, possession, and application of their own data. And it this becomes quite complicated with generative AI. And so that's something that we've been talking about. Um, and we're still doing some consultations and still doing some revisions about that. So we're, we're not going to be talking very much about it today in this presentation, but in the guidelines that come out, there will be information about that. So if we could go to the next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing here today for the next uh, little less than 60 minutes at this point. Um, talk a little bit about the background of where we're at, what our committee is, um, and uh, what we're doing. And then we will talk about principles that our committee has come up with. And I'll, I'll mention this in a little bit, but um, the committee has come up with a document that is in draft form that includes both high-level principles. Uh, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? includes both high level principles and um, more specific guidelines. And so what we've decided to do for this panel, because the guidelines are rather long and it would have taken a very long time to go through each one of the guidelines, what we've decided to do instead is to do an overview of the principles. And those principles are meant to be somewhat abstract and are meant to cover the areas that all the guidelines talk about in the rest of the document. So just to make this manageable, that's what we're going to focus on. And then each person in the panel who's speaking today, uh, who will introduce themselves, uh, will be talking a little bit about conversations around that area in the committee, what kinds of questions that have come forward, what kinds of issues uh, are being discussed. And then we will take questions from, uh, from you all who are attending this uh, panel. We did provide an opportunity for pre-submitted questions, but as far as I'm aware, none were pre-submitted. So we will be taking them uh, live. If you would like to submit a question, please use the Q&A function, um, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to them towards the end. So next slide, please. So a little bit of background, um, I and uh, two other folks here uh, are co-chairing a committee called the Teaching and Learning in Generative AI um, Advisory Committee. And this is a subcommittee of a broader committee at the institution, which is both campuses, as is our committee, um, that is uh, talking about generative AI in many aspects of, of work and study at UBC. So there's a larger, well, it's not larger, there's a broader committee talking about generative AI in a, in a sort of wider sense. And then there's a few subcommittees. And this one is a subcommittee that's focused on teaching and learning. 
So it has membership from uh, students, faculty, and staff from both campuses, from multiple um, disciplines, multiple areas, different central units. You'll hear from some of them today. Um, what we have been uh, tasked with is, is creating a set of guidelines for the use of generative AI in teaching and learning. And, and as I mentioned before, that document has both guidelines and high-level principles. So we'll be talking about that a little bit today. Consultations that have happened so far on the guidelines include folks with expertise in, in the areas of equity, accessibility, indigenous engagement, privacy and security, copyright and intellectual property. And we've also taken the a draft guidelines to both Senates and committees. So the Teaching and Learning Committee at Vancouver and the Learning and Research Committee at Okanagan. So if anybody is really interested in the draft that went to the Senate, you can go to the Senate websites uh, and see what was shared with them during their May meeting. So it was mid-May for both Senate. Um, and uh, you can just go to the to see the, the dockets. In the, the other committee, in the steering committee, there is a set of broader institutional principles that they have put forward and received um, endorsement from the executive. And you can see those at genai.ubc.ca slash guidance. And those are also fairly high level principles. And they, they do cover some of the same kinds of topics as we are talking about, such as privacy, data security, confidentiality, uh, intellectual property, um, and much more. Uh, and our task was to take similar kinds of topics and perhaps others and apply them specifically to the teaching and learning space. And so our guidelines are meant to sit within these broader principles that have come from uh, the steering committee. Uh, but be more specific to teaching and learning. So that's that's the the basic idea of what our committee is is doing. Um, one last thing before we move on to the next slide, and that is the timeline. So where are things? We uh, do have a draft document. It does have a set of principles, which we'll talk about, and some more specific guidelines that fit in with those principles. Um, it is still uh, undergoing a little bit more consultation and finalizing uh, reviews and revisions. And then it will go to both provosts for approval. And then at that point, we will um, uh, share them broadly with the institution. So that is, I am hoping uh, this month is when that will happen. So it kind of depends on how quickly we get some of these um, revisions worked on. So next slide, thank you. So as I mentioned, um, the document starts with a set of principles and I didn't realize how many we had until we started <laughs> numbering them. <laughs> so we have 15 principles. These are broad areas um, and broad statements about how generative AI should be approached in teaching and learning. Some of these we will talk about today. It would take too long, again, to cover all of the, the bases. So we will not be talking about all of the principles, but we pulled out a few that we thought might be of particular interest at the moment and that we were ready to speak to um, given the stage that things are. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, we've got things from um, uh, academic integrity you'll hear about later. Uh, opportunities to enhance education, uh, you'll hear a little bit about later, I believe. Gen AI, um, excuse me, uh, 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 equity and accessibility we'll be talking about, intellectual property and copyright and privacy and confidentiality and a few others as well. So um, I think without further ado, I will go ahead and get us started into the specific principles that we're going to talk about today. Thank you. So you've already met me. I'm the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President of Teaching and Learning Pro Tem at Vancouver. And I'm also a professor of teaching in the philosophy department. And I would also like to welcome Tammy Yazrobi to introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Tammy Yazrobi. I'm the Associate Director of Teaching and Learning Technology uh, for CTLT at the Vancouver campus. Thanks. And Tammy and I are going to talk about a few of these principles and what the, the um, 
committee has been talking about in relationship to them. So one of the very first things that we talked about in our committee was that use of generative AI should adhere to and be aligned with UBC strategic plans and commitments. So um, that's including the Indigenous strategic plan, um, the uh, STEER framework, the sustainability plans, the wellness, uh, the well-being framework. And the idea being that this isn't something in a vacuum. Generative AI is, is of course, being, being used within the institution, which has many other strategic plans and many other strategic commitments, and paying attention to those and having that be part of um, what we're talking about in the committee and part of the guidelines was really important uh, right from the very beginning. This was a very early um, discussion that we should include. Um, though, uh, mostly as I'm reflecting on what we have so far, our guidelines focus on equity, accessibility, and uh, decolonization and indigenous human rights. We don't actually have as much on sustainability. And that's in part because the broader principles that are coming from the steering committee do have a section on sustainability um, that says UBC is committed to sustainability, generative AI tools use significant amounts of electricity, users should consider choosing solutions and or vendors that limit and or reduce power consumption and leverage high quality renewable energy. Now, this is hard. It's hard to do with generative AI. So um, we didn't have anything further to say than what was already in, in uh, the higher level principles. So we don't have anything about sustainability. Wellness is something that uh, I think would be useful to, to think a bit more about as well. The so next slide, please. Another topic that was right from the very beginning, very important to the committee was um, making sure we're paying close attention to equity when we're thinking about the use of generative AI in teaching and learning. So our principle states, those using generative AI in teaching and learning should consider how biased training data and inputs can produce biased, discriminatory, inaccurate, or otherwise harmful outputs and their potential to perpetuate systemic inequities. So this is something that a um, number of people have talked about even from the very beginning of generative AI, even before ChatGPT came out in November, 2022. Um, so when you're training on data that has biases or that is focused on particular types of knowledge production, particular types of knowledge, particular methodologies, you're going to get outputs that reflect those. And so thinking about um, how uh, to talk with students about the potential bias in, in outputs that occur in, in generative AI and teaching and learning, thinking about how to review for potential bias and harms uh, are part of our guidelines, but also thinking about how generative AI can support inclusion, inclusion in teaching and learning. So for example, those who have trouble writing to get started with ideas um, may actually be helpful. So trying to strike a balance between the, the risks and the potential opportunities. So next slide, please. This is Tammy. Uh, yeah, so accessibility was a, a major topic that this group uh, considered while we were creating these guidelines. Uh, and so what the what the guideline themselves says is some Gen AI tools can enhance accessibility for learners with a large range of disabilities. And it's important to recognize there may be varying levels of accessibility to Gen AI tools, whether related to cost infrastructure, such as in accessible websites or applications or for other reasons. Um, so we did a lot of consultation with experts in equity and accessibility on both campuses, uh, including with the DRC and CFA. Um, and there was some good discussion around how AI can actually enhance accessibility. Um, so they can uh, support learners with disabilities by being used to produce information or vis in visual or audio formats, um, create captions for videos, alt text for images, um, or to help with executive function, et, et cetera. Um, but there are also challenges around accessibility that really should be considered um, around, you know, costing. So better functionality or more queries might make, will, will cost more, which would essentially be inequitable. Um, there's also issues with bandwidth. Uh, geographic location may potentially cause an issue with access. 
and the tools themselves might not be accessible. Uh, so those are all things people should consider when um, thinking about using Gen AI in teaching and learning. Um, and then the next slide will be about responsibility. Um, so the principle here is that those who generate and share outputs using Gen AI are accountable for them and have a responsibility to review them for inaccuracy and harm to the best of their ability. And the university will provide resources to help individuals develop the skills. Um, and so a lot of our discussion around this is that taking this responsibility requires that people understand how Gen AI works, the limitations of it, uh, the concerns around bias and potential harms and how to recognize those in outputs. Um, and so it's really important to review those outputs for those biases and harms. Um, and people might not know right now what to look for. This is a new technology um, for many people. You know, it's something they're just beginning to explore. And people also might not have a deep level of knowledge about equity. Uh, so those are both sort of areas where um, the subcommittee discussed making sure that there's some training available to people around these equity and accessibility issues um, related particularly to Gen AI. Um, so yeah, that's those are those areas. Thank you. I will ask Elisa and Malia to, I'm not sure who is going first. <laughs> yeah, I think Malia is going first. Thank you, Elisa. Um, my, my name is Malaya Oliver. I'm with the PRISM uh, within the Safety and Risk Services Unit. And I'm here to talk about uh, privacy and confidentiality before I pass it to my co-panelist, Elisa. But I will uh, let Elisa uh, introduce herself before I get started. Sure thing. Hi, everybody. My name is Elisa Baniasad. I'm the Acting Academic Director here at CTLT and also am a professor of teaching in computer science in UBC Vancouver. Thank you. Next slide, please. So privacy and confidentiality. Um, as we are exploring how generative AI fits within the UBC strategic uh, goals, we have to focus on privacy and confidentiality. Quite foundational, these principles ensure that um, our technology advances don't undermine what we really stand for, which is ensuring that personal information, anything that identifies individuals, um, is used in a manner that respects individual rights and that um, confidentiality protects that information from unauthorized access and use. Um, here at UBC, we make sure all personal data, no matter how it's used, meets strict privacy standards. This, uh, of course, upholds our commitment to fair access and respect for individual rights, supporting not only our compliance with the legislation, including um, Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, but also embracing the concept of information self-determination. Um, this empowers individuals at our institution to control their information um, affirming their right to decide how their data is used, collected, and shared. Um, together with our internal policies, we're driving these measures, and, um, and we, um, in the next minute, I will speak about how privacy impact assessment help us keep these commitments. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, privacy impact ass assessments are carefully set up to protect personal information. These assessments are especially important because of the large amount of data generative AI can process. Integrating generative AI into our ecosystem is a careful process that requires us to look closely at all of the potential risks, including data breach, unauthorized access, improper data handling, and issues with data minimization, retention, just to name a few. Next slide, please. And what is the key function of PIAs in context of generative AI, something that the guidelines speak closely to? They help us understand how AI tools use personal information. They focus on preventing the sharing of uh, personal information beyond what's necessary, um, and help us understand how the data moves and helps us set up strong safeguards. And of course, these assessments ensure that AI tools are used properly, especially with data that's safe. In the context of generative AI, we have conducted several assessments 
um, if your intended use generally falls within the assessed guidelines, um, a PIA may not be required. Um, we advise you that you um, avoid sharing personal, private, and confidential information to provide um, to unauthorized access and use. And always remember that generative AI tools are typically approved for scenarios that involve low-risk use. So now I'll pass the discussions to my co-panelists who will explore intellectual property and generative AI literacy. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Malia. Um, so yeah, intellectual property is a really interesting one when we're thinking about generative AI tools. I think um, many of us are really used to the notion of intellectual property when we're like, well, you know, we would never um, pass something off as our own or sell something that we don't own to somebody else. This is, you know, we all have that kind of already in our realm of understanding. Um, and we would never put something on a website pretending it was ours. But generative AI is kind of interesting because of the way that it works. It forces you to remember maybe more freshly the responsibilities around using these tools with respect to intellectual property and copyright. Um, so intellectual property and copyright, it's a, it's a very, I'm, I'm, you know, as you saw from my bio, I am definitely not a lawyer, um, cannot claim to be a, an expert on any level about intellectual property law. Um, or copyright law or that portion of uh, actually any law at all. Um, but uh, after, uh, you know, a lot of understanding and sort of uh, investigation into this, it seems like the it's a it's a very complex area of law, even, you know, even for lawyers. <laughs> I think it's a very complex area of law. One of the um, one of the complexities around it is just how do you know if you're in violation of copyright or how do you know if you're in violation of intellectual property? How do you know you violated somebody's intellectual property? And it's more complicated than just you know for sure that you've done it. So when you're thinking about intellectual property and copyright with respect to these tools, the idea is, and our advice is don't put yourself at risk for violating intellectual property rights of others and don't put yourself at risk for violating copyright. Um, the, the Gen AI tools, when you put something into them, if you take something from especially behind a paywall, like you have a, a journal subscription or something like that, you really wish that you could get help understanding the paper, which I can relate to. Um, the urge is to kind of throw it into chat GPT and say like, let's talk about this paper. This sounds great. But actually what you're doing, whenever you put something into chat GPT or any tool that hasn't passed the PIA process that Malaya just reviewed, um, is that you're publishing it effectively, um, almost as your own. So you're sort of taking ownership of it and you're kind of publishing it. And of course, you can only publish things that you own. Um, so it sort of puts you at risk of violating somebody else's intellectual property when you put things into ChatGPT. So if you take that paper and you put it into ChatGPT, you are potentially... Um, or you're definitely putting yourself at risk for having violated somebody else's intellectual property rights or um, for seeing a copyright claim. Um, so that's, it's like I said, it's a complicated area, but the thing to remember is that, um, that if, if something hasn't gone through that privacy impact process where, where it has been sort of said to you that it is safe to converse with this tool as though it's a private conversation, then you should assume it's a really public conversation and that the, anything that you put into the tool will be um, used uh, publicly in the future results from the tool. Um, so yeah, so that's those are kind of some of the risks of using using these tools with, um, with other people's intellectual property. Um, Malaya, does that kind of cover your, you are more lawyery than I am, that does that jive with what you? Understand. Um, it does. Uh, it does very well. I will. Uh, I will add that um, something of note with generative AI tools is that whatever it's producing and the output is likely information from other sources. So mm -hmm. by you using their content and publicizing their content, you are infringing obviously on their pri on their privacy and copyright laws. Um, but that information is not, um, it's not, it's, it's, it's not created just for you. It's just an mm -hmm. upcycle of 
data sets that they have and the probability of words coming next to each other. But that information already has been scraped from all different sources. So mm -hmm. um, reliability for that information and publicizing that information as your own is highly problematic beyond the intellectual property and copyright. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. I think um, that's yeah. Thank you. That's a that's an excellent point. That's the sort of flip side of it is that when you say, "Hey, make me a really wonderful haiku or something," the haiku is going to come back, and it may well be somebody else's, or really um, almost somebody else's. Um, or if you say, "You know, make me a logo for something," it could be a logo that actually already exists, um, or is close enough that you would be putting yourself at risk for someone saying you've violated my trademark or you violated my intellectual property. Um, and it is most certainly learning from others content. So it's not creating anything genuinely new itself. It is just creating an average of the things that, um, that other people have already put in. So it isn't your work. It is kind of like a Google search or like a Wikipedia or a something that, um, has been made because you asked for it, but it isn't actually original work. Um, so if you do care about the originality of work, then this isn't the way to get original work. Um, you're the best source for original work, I think is sort of the perspective in the teaching and learning community. Okay, next slide. Um, so in, in terms of Gen AI literacy, of course, everybody is probably feeling a little behind um, across the university. It's hard not to, since things are changing daily and weekly. Well, weekly and daily, that would have been a better ordering for that. Um, so what UBC is looking at across both campuses is sort of trying to understand actually what people really critically need to know uh, generally, um, what different groups need to need to know about Gen AI. Um, these guidelines and, and um, sort of areas of thought are a key beginning step, just understanding sort of what the basic facts are about Gen AI and how to apply it in, in your work or what's sort of allowed and what the guardrails are. But in addition, we're looking at um, some training for different groups. So faculty, staff, students, figuring out what each of these groups really needs to understand in their own work. And those will be coming out in the next little while. Um, probably, you know, we'll, you'll be hearing more about that as, as things evolve. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And now we have two more members of the committee. We have uh, Anita and Ainsley, and I will let them introduce themselves, talk about academic integrity. Great, um, thanks, Christina. Um, can everybody hear me? I was having some computer issues earlier, so that's good. Um, I'll introduce myself and then Anita, I'll pass over to you to introduce yourself and then I'll get, get us started on the principles. So my name is Ainsley Rouse. I'm the Associate Director of the Academic Integrity Hub on the UBC Vancouver campus. Hello everyone, I'm Anita Chaudhary. I'm a newly minted associate professor of teaching uh, in the same faculty, creative and critical studies and a faculty advisor uh, on academic integrity. Great, thanks. Um, and next slide, please. So to get things started, um, just a few words. I think that everybody in the virtual room knows that academic integrity has come up extremely frequently in relation to generative AI tools. It was an early point of focus when the tools first emerged and it's continued to be an area that attracts significant attention. So in this area and the guidelines, as Christina pointed out early on, we have both the high level principles and more specific guidelines. So what we're going to do in our section today is talk a little bit about the guidelines that are within this broader principle. But just to get things started, the high level principle that you see on the screen, all uses of Gen AI at UBC must uphold academic integrity and adhere to the academic misconduct regulations in the UBC Okanagan and Vancouver calendars. So from the outset, um, this is affirming that the UBC academic calendars are providing the rules that must be adhered to around the use of generative AI tools. Um, as we also know, artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT and others are not expressly named in the misconduct regulation, but their use might be considered various different types of academic misconduct, depending on the case. 
So the guidelines following this overarching principle um, go into uh, five or six different topics, and Anita and I are going to speak a little bit about those. So the first uh, guideline that is is covered um, is around the topic of permitted use. So this is one of the key questions that has come up. Um, yeah. So one of the key questions that has come up is just determining if, how, and when Gen AI tools can be used. So currently we have an FAQ that is published on the Academic Integrity website, and this has been up since very early days. And it just affirms the sort of overarching um, guidance that has been in place for a while now, which is that the use of generative AI tools at UBC is a course or program level decision. And it's important for instructors to set clear expectations around the use of these tools. Um, and to reinforce messaging throughout the term. So I won't go into that further because I know that Anita is going to speak a little bit about syllabus statements later on. But um, another thing that came up in discussions that we had during these meetings throughout the year is just an awareness that it, it's especially important to communicate this given that students might be navigating differing levels of permission um, in multiple courses. And it was important to communicate in a clear and straightforward manner. We also point out in the guidelines that any use outside of those stated rules may be considered misconduct. And we make a link to this um, academic integrity website, FAQ. Another topic that was um, very present during our discussions over the past year has been that of the detection of Gen AI. So currently, um, there, there is an announcement about UBC's decision not to enable the AI detection feature in Turnitin, which was made last April and then again reaffirmed in August. So that's something that's currently available. In the guidelines, um, we have slightly stronger language stating that the use of applications to detect AI-generated text is strongly discouraged at this time due to concerns about effectiveness, accuracy, bias, privacy, and intellectual property. Um, we also talk about how instructors should not submit academic work or personal information to AI detectors that have not undergone a PIA and have been approved uh, for this use. As of May 2024, we specify no AI detection tools have undergone a PIA. And we also discussed quite a bit in the group um, around sort of disclosure of use. So we do include aspects of, you know, if detectors, if any detectors are approved in the future, it's recommended that faculty members include information in their syllabi stating that such tools may be used. Um, one of the questions that has followed that discussion about detectors is, well, how then to detect Gen AI? Um, and so we include some information in the guidelines section about the current misconduct processes, including resources that UBC already has online about an overview of the misconduct process, um, what to follow, as well as providing information um, to students who might have questions and who would like support from advocacy services or from the ombudsperson. So we try to take that sort of all-encompassing view of this new thing that has appeared, but also reinforcing messaging around sort of these basic concepts of academic integrity. So on that note, I will pass it over to Anita. Thanks, Ainsley. Um, so I'll be um, talking about the syllabus statement, the citation, and designing assessment. Again, three, um, three items that are talked about in as part of the guidelines. So the syllabus statement, the guidelines recognizes it as an important section to set clear expectations around the use of generative AI tools and reinforce this messaging throughout the term. It is also an important reminder for students who may be navigating different levels of generative AI permissions in multiple courses. So communicating expectations of your course in a clear and straightforward manner is important. Uh, the UBC Academic Integrity website has syllabus uh, statement sample syllabus statements that can be used to communicate to students permitted and prohibited use of Gen AI in courses. Secondly, when it comes to citation practices, if uh, Gen AI tools are allowed for student academic use, um, educators should make it clear to students how they should acknowledge its use, such as through citation. If students are not sure whether and how to acknowledge use of Gen AI for their academic work, they should reach out to their instructors or supervisors to clarify expectations. And this can be stated as part of uh, the syllabus statement. 
Um, the UBC Libraries Guide on Generative AI provides information on how to cite, the use of Gen AI tools in multiple citation styles, um, evaluating information sources, etc. And these are all very useful for classroom purposes. And finally, um, when it comes to designing assessment, educators can test the resiliency of their own assignments and assessments against the capabilities of Gen AI tools if they choose uh, by submitting their assignment instructors uh, instructions uh, to a Gen AI platform to understand its capabilities and limitations. A few notes, of course, something that uh, Alyssa and Malia uh, mentioned uh, previously, please submit on the materials that is your own or for which you have received express permission to submit for this purpose. And secondly, it is important to be aware that in uh, doing so by sharing the material, the content uh, could be used to train Gen AI tools and could emerge publicly depending on the tool being used. Uh, so for support related to uh, designing assignments and assessment that either use uh, generative AI or mitigate against its use for academic integrity purposes, um, there are resources, and I'll put those in the link in a minute, uh, educators who may choose to have more in-class um, assessment types to mitigate the use of generative AI, uh, the accommodations, considerations for in-class assessments is also a useful uh, reference point. So here are all the references that might come in handy for you. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna hand it over to the next panelist. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have our last uh, section of the presentation and then we'll uh, hopefully have time for questions. So I will let Tamara and Drayden introduce themselves. So I'm not sure who is going first. Thanks. Um, actually, Drayden, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself first, and then I will introduce myself and roll straight into my slides, and then you can wrap up with your slides if that's okay. Perfect. So Sounds good. Um, well, as you can see on the slide here, uh, I'm Drayden Fontana. I'm the VP Academic and University Affairs of the AMS, um, and I am an undergraduate student in the Faculty of Arts and Applied Science. Um, I always say, in other words, that means I'll be here a long time. Um, but it was, uh, I, I, I felt I was um, in a good position to talk about the different applications uh, of Gen AI in arts and applied science. So I'll leave it to you, Tam Tamara. Great, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Tamara Evil. I am teaching on the UBC Okanagan campus. Uh, I'm a lecturer with the Faculty of Management and I, I do want to say I'm always a little bit horrified to see that my title is lecturer because I think that anybody who envisions that I stand at the front at a podium and and speak to instead of engage with. So I'd like to say that I interpret lecture as facilitator of learning. So um, I, they just won't let me put that on my business card. So um, yeah, I'm with faculty of management. I'm also an elected senator on the Okanagan campus as well. And I'm proud to be with Drayden and Christina, co-chair of this of the working group that did the principles and guidelines. Sorry, uh, so if you could advance the slide, Barbara, please. Thanks so much. I, I'm gonna speak on a few principles related. Uh, we've got it in the context of teaching. Um, reality is a lot of these are important things for even our students to understand and, and perhaps also follow through with, but um, these are not all of our guidelines. These are not rules and policies. These are the principles uh, and it's a few of them. So uh, the first one I wanna speak to is an acknowledgement that Gen AI can actually provide opportunities to enhance the education and experience uh, for our students and as well for ourselves. Gen AI can provide significant value uh, in our teaching because uh, it can allow us to be uh, maybe more efficient to some of those mundane things that we do. Maybe we can find different ways, things that we've been doing for a long time. It can give us some creative and new ideas to start thinking from. Um, and also in the learning activities. So learning for us, learning for our students, learning throughout our UBC community. Um, but we do highlight a lot of what was discussed earlier. It needs to be an informed, responsible, and ethical use of Gen AI. We need to be aware of the risks. We need to be considering how um, impactful those risks can be, and we need to mitigate those risks. So we have things like PIA, et cetera. 
Uh, and we need to understand that sometimes the harms aren't obvious. Sometimes the harms are potential harms, things we might not be outright considering, uh, things where a bias is helping the tool train the data and then what is being spit out to us. If we use that, we are potentially perpetuating harms that I, 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 generally I would suggest would never be intentional but we need to be aware that there are potential harms. So it's it's a balance, as Christina mentioned earlier, a balance between um, providing a mitigated risk approach, but also recognizing there is great value. Uh, there can be great value in teaching and learning from use of Gen AI. So again, an overarching principle, but really key to teaching and learning. Next slide, please, Barbara. Thank you. So probably many of you are here for the, what's the punchline? When can we use this? So here's kind of the, the answer that is not a defined checkpoint checklist answer, but th this is it right here for using this, whether we're faculty member, whether we're staff, lecturer, AKA facilitator of learning, whatever we might call ourselves, faculty and staff may use Gen AI for teaching and learning related work as we choose, provided we stay within the bounds of legal, university, faculty level, program level, school level, department level, whatever that may be, the policies and requirements um, that have been set there, as well as the guidelines that, again, as Christina said, uh, we're hoping to be actually presenting out, hopefully, fingers crossed this month. We are not coming up with something new that gets around what already exists. We already have strategic plans. There are already laws in place and ever evolving. University itself has uh, requirements and limitations of what it does and doesn't allow, as do our faculties, our schools, our departments, and our programs. So these principles, as well as the guidelines that will be coming forth, need to stay within that scope. We are not doing something around or outside of that. So it's just a matter of good practice as we hopefully have always been doing is being aware of what we are and aren't allowed to do based on where, what our place is um, in the organization at UBC um, and, and using it then responsibly and appropriately and ethically. And I think I have one more slide before I pass it to Drayden. Uh, thank you. Whether it's Gen AI or pre-Gen AI back in the day, however far that may have been, all output from Gen AI for teaching and learning, in fact, all material that we've ever used, whether it be a book or other research or Google or anything else, it really should undergo human review before sharing. We would hope that we would never have before Gen AI gone into a book and just taken something and said, well, that must be fact and or gone into uh, Google or Wikipedia or something else and said, because it's on the internet, it must be true. We need to continue now, as we always have, thinking critically about the output, in this case from Gen AI, but as always, we should be thinking about critically about output and then include in that consideration, as we've talked about already, the potential that there could be false and misleading information, but also that there could be harm um, and bias in that information. Uh, and especially if the sources of the information from the tool's output can't be identified and verified. I have heard of cases where students have asked ChatGPT, they've prompted, they've gotten something and then they've prompted further and they've gotten something further. And then they say, oh gosh, I have to cite this. So they ask ChatGPT, give me the citations for this. And they get citations back that are hallucinations some of the times. They are, um, you go, yes, that resource exists, but the material I got from that it is not at all in that resource and or that resource doesn't even exist. So we need to be especially thoughtful that the sources of what's coming out, even if we ask the tool to cite things, may not be, um, the, the tool may not tell us where it came from and or it may tell us something that we're, that we're not able to verify. So I think that those are the main points that I'm going to raise with you today on the principles. Again, a lot more guidelines that will come from this, um, all of which are still bound by legal, university, and faculty uh, policies and procedures. 
Uh, and then the Drayden, I think the next few are for you. Right. Um, so on the student use of uh, Gen AI, um, this part is very much centered on the uh, kind of forward thinking um, part of the of the guidelines. And um, I was really excited to tackle this uh, because uh, it's really thinking about how Gen AI can be used to elevate work. Um, obviously, incorporating all the other aspects um, of human oversight, making sure that information is accurate, making sure that sources are cited. Um, but within that framework, how can work produced uh, be elevated uh, by Gen AI? Are there ways that Gen AI um, can improve work? Um, and the, the example that I come back to, the metaphor, uh, and I'm going to beat this metaphor to death, uh, I've used it many times, is, is the calculator metaphor, uh, which is, you know, calculators are invented um, and everyone panics because students are not going to be able to do operations like they used to be able to do operations. Um, and then we realize, well, now we have students who maybe weren't as good as op at operations, but are very good at integral calculus. I was probably not the best person at my high school at mathematical operations, but not everyone that was better than me could do integral calculus. Um, and so that, uh, that framework, when you apply that to Gen AI, you start to see that there might be way more, there's, how many people are we missing um, when it, as, a, as a result of their disability, perhaps, um, that they can't get the words out, but they have so many ideas to share with us, that they have so much that they can produce and share with the world um, that they they haven't been able to because they don't have this this Gen AI framework. Um, so it, on that same on that same metaphor, thinking about if it's uh, if you start randomly typing on a calculator and pressing uh, enter, the output you're going to get uh, isn't going to be necessarily anything useful at all, uh, but the output you get with careful thought and the generation of new ideas uh, could be something very useful. Um, and as we spoke about earlier, by its very nature, Gen AI can't produce new ideas. Um, so you're not gonna see original things coming from it, but if you give it out an input, which is original, you might get an output that's an original. Um, so that's um, one, of the, one of the, I guess, positive ways of seeing uh, the the elevation of what Gen AI can do um, uh, for students. And one of the things that has been engaged on is seeing how students are using it currently to explain new ways, uh, uh, new ways to explain a concept to them. If they, uh, their professor didn't explain it how um, in the, in the way that kind of they can understand, put it into some Gen AI and the Gen AI spits out something that explains it to them that makes sense. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we're learning students are using uh, Gen AI that can enhance their learning and can enhance their outputs. Um, and so it's we're learning and growing. Obviously, this is up to the individual professor's rules. So the students still have to follow the individual rules um, of each professor. Um, but that's uh, some of the talk in the direction um, that student use has that we've heard from students. Um, next slide. Right. Um, oh, um, yeah, sorry. I think I've had a different slide here, but um, yeah, so on the on the point of transparency, uh, similar to uh, what we talked about uh, in human oversight of looking at where the sources are, or intellectual property, sorry, and where the sources are coming from, um, making sure that when you produce something that you're acknowledging where that's coming from. Um, if you produce something, you have to sort cite that source just like you would cite any other uh, text. Um, and so it's important to acknowledge that you're getting help from Gen AI if you're using Gen AI. Um, but it does come with kind of those, those drawbacks, which are that Gen AI is essentially a black box. It's a function that's, it has a ton of inputs and we can't see what that function is doing to those inputs, where those inputs are coming from. And so that drawback on transparency is, yes, you can say, I've used Gen AI, uh, but you can't say that I've got it from this or that source. Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, thanks for your time. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody here who uh, presented on, on uh, one or more of the guidelines, excuse me, the principles.
<clears throat> we have just a little bit of time for questions. If you have a question, you can add it to the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen um, on the Zoom. Um, I can't, I don't know if people have the option to raise their hand or not, um, but there is at least the Q&A function that you can use if you have questions. And as we're waiting, I will just say, um, as a reminder, we are finalizing the guidelines document and uh, hope to have that ready within the month um, to share with everybody in its, uh, I wouldn't say final form, I would say um, first form. We're calling it version 1.0 uh, because it is very likely going to need to um, uh, uh, be revised over time. And so we're hoping to release version 1.0 um, in June and um, happy to uh, uh, take questions, which I see there is a question. And I don't know that everybody else can see it, um, but Tamara, did you want to say something or should I read the question in uh, the chat? I just, I just wanted to ask, because I think that it's probably top of people's mind. We keep saying that these are going to be coming out. They'll be coming out. Where will people find these? How will they know when these are Mm -hmm. Oh, and how do we make it or have we given thought? Um, I know the answer, but if you could answer this, um, <laughs> how do we have we given thought to making it that by the time these get out there, they're not obsolete, these principles and guidelines? Uh, yes. Yeah. So how will people know that they're coming out? So we do have a communications plan um, that uh, we have partially worked on. Um, so uh, just meaning that we're still working on the student part, but we do have a, a sense of how we will get the communications out to faculty, which is a typical way that we often do, which is to go through the dean's offices and to the heads and directors and, and then to faculty. Um, we will also be posting them on the genai.ubc.ca website. Um, which is where the current principles, um, the, the broader principles are already posted. So they will be posted there as well. Um, and then in terms of how we will keep them up to date, um, sorry, we're going to post these on a website, probably on the uh, provost office websites on both campuses. Um, and uh, uh, so we will be sharing links to those in as many places as we possibly can. And how we'll keep them up to date um, is is uh, something that's going to need to be worked on through the provost offices on both campuses and also in consultation with various folks, um, because we do know that as as things change over time, um, the, the guidelines will need to change. Um, uh, let's see. So we do have a question in the chat, and I think we also have questions in the Q&A that maybe some of the panelists could address directly. But the question in the chat is, what kind of awareness raising approach do you intend to take with the guidelines document? For example, videos, infographics, et cetera, or next steps. It's an incredible document, but thinking of how many times trapped faculty may not read all 12 pages in depth, I totally understand that. <laughs> so we are thinking of something like an infographic or a you know, top 10 things to know, but we have to do it in a way that people will actually go and read the other things too, because if we make it too comprehensive people will be like this is all i need to know right um but in fact there's going to be other more important not more important but certainly very important details uh in in the other documents so we're trying to to do something that will entice people and um, to want to pay attention um but then also you know it's hard to avoid uh the fact that this is just a complex space and so there's going to be a lot of complicated guidelines right uh, can we email the links? Yes, uh, I think that CTLT will be doing that to uh, the panel attendees. So definitely. Um, let's see, what else do we have in the questions? Um, we only have a couple minutes, but uh, there was a question from Malia, Malaya, on your typing and answer. Okay. I can just socialize it in terms of um, IP issues. I think the, gu the guidance that we provide to our community is that only interact with low risk information. IP here under information security standard U1 is considered medium risk. So we would not, um, we would not um, recommend using that information, copying and pasting into any generative AI tool at this point. 
Um, the assumption here is that most tools, though some tools we can confirm that they will not take your data for training um, overall, the assumption is that they will take your data for training. And unless we've approved otherwise, interacting with data that is not low risk means that your input and output will, is essentially um, consumed by the system. And so, um, um, yeah, I hope I've addressed that question. Happy to take a follow-up if need be. Thank you. Yes, that, that would be great if folks could could connect with you. Um, I've just put into the chat, and again, we will also send out another link that's that's quite useful in terms of uh, privacy. So on the, the gen, no, sorry, it is the ai.ctlt.ubc.ca website. There is a page that talks about privacy impact assessments for um, generative AI tools used for teaching and learning. And right now it's got information about ChatGPT 3.5 and Microsoft Copilot for organizations and ways in which you can currently use those in teaching and learning and ways in which you should not. <laughs> Um, so that's a really important page to pay attention to as you're planning for courses or um, uh, coming up soon, hopefully. <clears throat> and I uh, really appreciate folks coming and uh, listening to our in-progress <laughs> uh, uh, discussion about the uh, guidelines that aren't quite ready. We were hoping... Um, originally to have them ready by, well, originally this panel was supposed to be for Celebrate Learning Week, but unfortunately I got very ill, so we had to move it uh, and, and postpone it. So thanks to those who waited uh, to join us for this version. Um, and you will be able to uh, uh, see the guidelines in their more rhinolized form, hopefully very soon. <clears throat> Oh, and there is a final question. Is any of the content in the guidelines or when it is approved be considered Creative Commons? I think that's a really great question and I don't at the moment see any reason why not. <laughs> yeah, we haven't talked about it, but but I, I would see that would be a valuable thing to do. So thanks for that suggestion. Thanks everybody. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to uh, the CTLT uh, events team uh, and, and others who have been helping so much with this um, uh, panel and also to Barbara who is helping us as well. And thanks to you for joining us. If you have questions, thoughts, comments, please uh, do reach out. We're happy to, we're happy to help. Thanks. See you at another event. <laughs>